Welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. My name is Shona Lee and I'm a Dritzilla. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what a Dritzilla is before I give you my story. A Dritzilla is a Yiddish oral storyteller uh, from a woman's tradition, but it also contains large amounts of Sephardi story. It's peculiar to the Netherlands to Flanders, to the lowlands of Europe. And because it's a woman's, uh, a woman's tradition, it was never written down. So very little is known about it. It was passed down from grandmother to granddaughter. And we can trace it back five generations in our family, but we know the tradition is older than that. You start to learn at the age of four through a series of games and exercises that allow you to look at story and then you also learn um, uh, a large amount of material. There's about 4,000 stories that you learn that are set into beautiful cycles of story. Those cycles and sub-cycles usually take me about three to four days to tell but I'm not going to keep you here for that long. I'm going to tell you a story called The Price of a Soul. In my tradition, it's an Elijah story called The Peddler with the Red Thread, and it's quite a long story, but I've managed to find a shorter version in a rabbinical set of stories, and that's the one I'm going to tell you. Normally, what you would do in my tradition is you would say, that's another story, and the listeners would say, for another time, and they could request any of those stories. But also, we can't really do that uh, as I'm filming in my kitchen and uh, the goldfish doesn't have the capacity to do that. So, the price of a soul. There was once a great rabbi, they say his name was the Baal Shem Tov, the best if you would. And the Baal Shem Tov had many students and disciples, but 12 favorite ones. He would say to them often, when it is my turn to graduate, to go beyond, you must take over my work. You must be responsible for the orphans and the widows and the poor and the sick, for the education of children and adults, for the welfare of the community, for all of these things, for seeing court cases, for law, all of these things, and one of you must be my storyteller. And the students would talk amongst themselves. And one student, Reb Yenkel, always thought, the storyteller. Oh, please, please, please don't let me be the storyteller. You see, he wanted to get married. He had the love of his life and, and he wanted to be able to give her a fine house and, 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 and her own hearth and take care of her. And he knew that storytellers never made any money. So he hoped that when the time came, he wouldn't be appointed to the task. Well, time passed, as it does in stories, and one day the rabbi called his students before him and allotted each task. To you, you will look after the poor, you will look after the sick, you will look after the widows and you will look after the children, you will be responsible for taxes, you'll be responsible for the law. And so it went on and on and on, and all the while Reb Yenkel there going, oh, please, please, no, no, no until, of course you guessed it, he gets to Reb Yankel and says, oh, Reb, you will be my storyteller. Thank you, says Reb, <laughs> and tries to smile. Well, you don't fool a wonder-working rabbi like that, do you? And he looks at Reb and he says, Reb, I know your hopes and dreams. One day, you will tell a story that will be... <laughs> too much to drink at lunchtime. You will tell a story that will be worth its weight in gold. Really, Rabbi says, yeah, uh, Reb? Indeed. And so, after a few months, when the time comes, when the Rabbi, he walks up the stairs to bed and they say his body rests and his soul continues heavenwards and he is called home, the tasks are allotted. Rebienkel knows 
that he will always be welcomed at every fire, but it will not be his own. He will always have clothes, but they will always have been worn by somebody else. And he'll always have a few uh, grateful coppers in his purse, in his pocket, but he'll never make his fortune. And he clings to this idea that one day he will tell a story that will be worth its weight in gold. But nothing happens. He says goodbye to his sweetheart. She promises to wait. Months, years pass. It's Reb. Give him a place by the fire. It's Reb. Bring out that old coat we've been keeping in the attic. <laughs> Never mind the moths. It's company on the road. And so he's always welcomed and he tells such stories. He tells stories of ruby trees and diamond girls, of goat horn bees and opal forests. He tells stories of emerald seas and sapphire staffs. But all those are other stories for other times. Wherever he goes, he is welcomed, but his face and his demeanour gets sadder and sadder until one day he's walking along a cliff path when coming towards him is a kinsman from his own town recognises Reb at once and says Reb, Reb there is a merchant down in that town and he is getting ready to marry off his only son he loves stories, he's renowned for it and he will pay good money for any story. If anyone can make a good living down there, Reb, it's you. Maybe this is what he's been waiting for since Reb. Maybe this is the, the story that is going to make me a fortune. He thanks his kinsman and off he goes. And when he arrives down at the, the town, he makes his way to a, a rich house. And sure enough, in the courtyard, there is the klezmerim, the musicians in the corner playing. There is decorations and tables laden with food and, and everyone running everywhere and there is a, a man in a rich suit in the corner. Well, he must be the merchant. Say, uh, 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 are you the, the, the merchant that wants to hear stories? Indeed I am, says the merchant. In fact, I love them so much, worked so hard this morning. Sit down. Tell me one now. Reb sits down, looks at the merchant, opens his mouth. <gasps> There's nothing. He doesn't have a single story. They have fled from his mind, from the corridors of his brain like fickle friends. Instead of getting angry, the merchant looks and says, look, it's the, the dust on your tongue. It's the road in your bones. Go and, and sleep for a while, and this evening when we have the first of many feasts, I'm sure you'll entertain us. And so Reb sleeps, a long, deep sleep, crowded with dreams. Snow tears and fire wolves, marshed and mountains, clouds and herbs, goats, many, many goats, but they are all stories for other times. When he wakes up, he has a head full of stories. Such stories he will tell tonight. And so, after the feasting, there's dancers and jugglers and music. And the merchant says, and now our storyteller. And Reb stands up. Hey. I, the more he tries to grab the stories, it's like, uh, you know, when you try and grab soap in the bath? It just flees. He cannot hold a single story. Never mind, says the merchant, tomorrow night. But the same thing happens the next night and the next and the next. Night after night, Reb is so embarrassed. When he goes to sleep, they're all there. But in the morning when he tries to tell, or in the evening over uh, supper, nothing. One night when he gets up to tell and they've all gone, the poor young man flushes red in the cheeks, turns to the merchant and says, I am so sorry. 
I am so embarrassed. I am, I am, um, I am ashamed to my, my poor master. I'm ashamed to you. I, 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 I cannot bear it any longer. I must leave. I have imposed on your hospitality enough. And, and he runs and picks up his bag and leaves the merchant's house. The merchant, feeling sorry for the young man, says, look, um, coachman, find that young man, take him wherever he wishes to go. Coachman sets off, sees Reb Yenkel walking a lonely road, picks him up and, and they are just by the coast path when Reb leans out of the coach and says, stop, stop, turn the coach around. I've got a story, not much of a story, but I've got a story. Take me back to the merchant's house. Well, I don't know if it's possible to do a handbrake turn with a coach and four, but the coachman does it turns the coach around and they roar back to the merchant's house, screeches it to a halt. He jumps out, tumbles over, runs into the feasting hall, runs up to the merchant. I have a story. I have. It's not much of a story. Don't even know the ending. Not really quite sure how I know it. It's not the best one. It's not the best one I have, but it just tell the story, says the merchant. I don't really know the end. It doesn't matter. <sighs> okay, says someone. It starts like this. The Baal Shem Tov, my master, came to me one Passover Eve and said we must travel a long way. There was a soul in need of our help. And I said, but Rabbi, if we travel too far, we'll not be back in time for Pesach, for Passover. Nevertheless, he was insistent and we set off. When we travelled in that coach, we travelled and the stars, oh, they rolled past. It seemed like we had travelled a hundred miles in a minute, but we must have travelled all, no all night because when we arrived it was daybreak and I could see that we'd travelled a long way because the houses looked different, the, the light was different, the, the dress of the people that I could see was different, the, the smells, the spices, the cooking was different. Strange to me streets seemed deserted except in one corner there was a, a, a great town square and in that town square there was a judge standing on an impressive podium addressing what looked like the whole town and the whole town were there and they had cudgels that they were beating into their fists there was anger and hatred and Reb Yenkel felt afraid the rabbi took the coach to the poor quarter, to the Jewish quarter of the city. And then he got out and knocked on a woman's door. The woman opened it, seeing the rabbi and his uh, students said, come in, come in, are you stupid? Do you not know what day this is? Well, Reb had never heard anyone call his master stupid, but she dragged them inside and shut the door. She said, this is the day of the beatings. The beatings, thought Reb. That judge, in the marketplace is the cruelest man alive. Once a year, he allows the citizens of this place to run wild through the streets and you can beat up any Jew you find in the streets on that day. You could take his life and there will be no recompense. For one day a, a, a year, madness reigns. And those of us with any sense lock, shut and bar our doors and try and remain quiet and safe. When the old woman had finished speaking, the rabbi turns to Reb Yenkel and says, that reminds me, that reminds me while we're here. Reb, could you go into the market square and bring back the judge? Bring back the judge. But master, that th th they will kill me. Oh, you exaggerate, go and bring back the judge. Well, he couldn't say no to his master, but he knew it was the end of him. And he looked and he went, tell my mother I love her. I'm really sorry about the vase. And off he went. He went into the marketplace and as he got there, he expected them to fall upon him, but they spread. He went up to the judge and, and he looked and he said, my, my master, the Baal Shem Tov wishes to see you on a matter of urgency. And he expected the judge to bring his fist down on him, but the judge paled, looked at Reb Yenkel and said, tell your master I will be there in an hour. 
Of course I will. You didn't need to tell him twice. Reb turned tail and ran. Got back to the house, shut the door, explained the message, and the rabbi, he'd never seen him so furious, he <laughs> stamped his fist. He said, you go back and you tell that judge that he is to come now or the deal is off. You want me to go back there a second time? Of course. Tell my mother I'm sorry about the curtains and I love her dearly and also my father. Tell him I love him too. And off he went again. Well, he again went to the market square. The uh, crowd parted. He went up to the judge and delivered his message and instead of being harangued and beaten, the judge paled. He stilled his hand to the crowd and said, you must stay there, I will return. And so he went with Reb Yenkel. He didn't say a word. They reached the house, the door was opened, the rabbi took that judge up to a room, shut the door. Reb Yenkel and the old woman pressed their ears against the door to try and hear what was said, but they couldn't hear a word. And then when it was over, the judge came out and he looked calmer. There was a smile upon his face. He shook the rabbi's hand, he went back to the marketplace. Reb Yenkel and the rabbi get back in the carriage. They must have ridden hundreds of miles back. And this is the peculiar thing, said Reb Yenkel. We got back no more than an hour after we had left. It's not a great story, said Reb Yenkel. I can't actually remember the end, but it's the only one on my tongue. I love this story, said the judge. I know the ending. Let me tell you. You see, the judge of that place. The judge of that place was not a good man. He hated his birthright. He hated his people and so he travelled many miles and, and took a, uh, anything that identified him as a Jew he threw away. He threw himself into the work of the town and he found by accident that the more he made laws that uh, sectioned people off that uh, were not for the poor. The more he um, he persecuted people, the more popular he became. And the more he persecuted Jews, the more in rank he was raised. He craved the power. He loved it. Nobody would guess. He instigated the beating once a year. And that was his idea. And all was well in his world except one day he looked into the crowd and he saw a woman from his hometown she could give him away how could he silence her he'd once loved her he didn't want to kill her although he was capable of it no he would silence her in the only way he could think of to do he married her things were different then she never spoke. The deal was she would never refer to her heritage, her culture, her people or her past. And she was true to her word for she valued her life. She never spoke of it. Except one night the judge came back early, unexpected. They had had a small baby boy a few months previous. And as he walked in through the door he heard his wife singing. She sang to the child. The judge was furious. He said, you promised, never. She said, that was before I was a mother. 
That was before. Do you want your son to grow up with no idea of who he is, of where he has come from, of his birthright? Indeed I do, he said, but when he looked into his wife's eyes, there was no arguing with her. He knew that he had to silence her forever. And so that very night he went to a masha, a witch, and he got a potion and a spell and a comb. And that night he gave his wife this comb, a gift, my dear, use it please. And she used it to comb and braid her hair. And that night while she slept, he sprinkled that potion around her pillow. He took a silver knife and he uh, laid on it the incantations that the Mashef had told him. He took that knife, he cut off her hair and he bridled her with her own hair. She awoke, she went to scream, she couldn't make a noise, her eyes wild with terror. And as she looked at him, her face and her form began to transform. And she, there, as a horse, a grey mare. And that grey mare, through its hooves, whinnied, terrified, bridled with its own hair, and rode out into the night. What became of that grey mare is another story for another time. But then the nightmares began to start for the judge. He began to dream and his dreams, the worst dreams of all, were there was a table and on that table a dry, grey, withered thing and around it the grey beards, they were poking it prodding it, saying it is desiccated, it is finished, and he knew that that grey thing was his own soul. He had condemned himself. And then finally there was one, the Bel Shem Tov, poking it, saying, oh no, a little moisture, a little hope. And in his dream, he approached the Bel Shem Tov and said, can you help me? Indeed I can but you must come when I call. And so you see, said the merchant, I was that judge. And when you called the first time, I didn't want to give up that power. But when you called the second, I knew it was my last chance. And I went with you and I went up into that room and the conversation that you could not hear was this. I asked, what I should do to save my soul. And your master said that I must go back, revoke every law I had ever done. I must give back recompense and I must find a way to make those people live in peace. And when I had finished that, I was to become a rich merchant, but I was to give hospitality and always look after the poor. And this I have done over and over again. But just before I left, I, I turned to him. I said, Rabbi, how will I know if I have done enough? How will I know if you have interceded for me and saved my soul? And he said, it will be very simple and easy, my friend. You will know. You will know when you hear your own story told back to you. Oh, Reb Yenkel, said the merchant, to you, a story without an end, but to me, to me it is my soul. It is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> its weight in gold, said Reb Yenkel, its weight in gold. And he saw a new coat and indeed bought himself a house and married the woman of his dreams and as far as I know is telling still. Thank you. People, wherever you are, thank you for listening to that last storyteller. What an amazing performance. And if you enjoyed it, 
the hat looked just below the story. If you're on the website, and I do encourage you to go to the website, and you can put a little in the hat. If you're in Texas, you've got a Texas hat here. Yeah. Got this in Kerrville. You could drop a dollar in, or two. If you're in England, you can drop a pound in, or more. If you're in Canada, where well, you could drop a few count of dollars in. And maybe if you're right up north in Lapland, you could drop a few kroner in, or maybe a euro or two. It will be much appreciate it. Thank you. Don't forget the hat and enjoy the stories.